Hi, everybody. My name is Dave Haynes. I'm the editor of 69, which is a digital science publication. I've been doing that since the dawn of man. Uh, you're here to, to uh, for a lead, pardon me, for an end users roundtable, just talking about broadly the technology. I'm going to let each of these people introduce themselves because they're going to do a better job than I will. Yeah. Hi, my name is Juan Lalinde. I'm the director of supply planning for uh, Full Swing Golf. Hi, I'm Jeff Postolo, Executive Director for Teaching and Learning Technologies at the University of South Carolina. Hello everyone, my name is Chris Dietrich and I'm the Manager of Instructional Technology at the University of Arizona College of Medicine. All right. Uh, I wanted to ask first about the past couple of years. I know it's, it's a bit of a tired topic, but it's, it's particularly interesting in the context of AV because if you're working in any kind of a corporate venue, education venue, hospitals, whatever it may be, many, many things changed. And I'm curious what you guys did to adjust or pivot in, in certain respects. For, for us at Full Swing, um, we, we are a technology company, but we execute as construction. Um, so for us to be able to meet a deadline at a customer, it was, it was key to enhance and improve communication with partners. Yeah. Um, in the, case, in the case of projection, um, companies like Sony, we have very close relationship with the team um, and providing forecast and visibility to what's coming allow us to get ahead of a lot of the issues that were in the supply chain uh, mm -hmm. to get ahead. So with the challenges of not being able to meet face-to-face -face and go to sites and you know, do all that um, traditional way of <laughs> managing the business, the frequency of the meetings, the sharing of data, constantly updating inventory levels and, and all that kind of stuff was, was paramount for us to succeed and, and keep going through mm -hmm. a, a challenging period. Right. Like this. So uh, for us in higher ed, um, the last few years have been really challenging in, in that we had to quickly pivot to, uh, while we had uh, quite a number of online courses, uh, uh, we had a pretty good mix of face-to-face uh, -face instruction as well as uh, online. Uh, the last few years we learned that uh, the need to actually uh, be able to pivot, to use your word, uh, uh, to online instruction uh, on a very large scale for a university of our size, uh, we had to scramble pretty quickly uh, to meet the challenge of uh, uh, basically putting every course online. Uh, so we were able to do that. We, uh, I think, competed with every other university uh, in the nation for product, uh, for product that we didn't have already in place. Uh, but uh, through, you know, having really, really good resources and really good leadership at our university. In, in working with Sony and in companies like Sony, we were able to, to make that shift pretty quickly. All right, Chris. Oh yeah, just to really add to what you just said, I mean, we, we had to pivot as well from a completely in-person environment. Again, our focus is health sciences or so are a medical campus first and foremost. And as much as we want to adopt a fully virtual model, I'm not sure we can all agree you want your doctor becoming a doctor online. <laughs> so the, there is a point where you do need to come back in person. And so we've had to get used to 100% in person, nothing virtual, to a hybrid model, making it work temporarily while we got through the pandemic, and then coming back to in person again. But there are certain areas we realized, okay, maybe you don't need to be here for that, and we can help leverage uh, certain solutions through web conferencing and being able to work again directly with Sony, one of our key partners, uh, finding the technology to fill that gap and allow us to try and bridge the learning in a hybrid model where that can be used. You know, again, it's not everywhere, uh, but there are certain pieces in our curriculum that we found that it's actually more beneficial. So, yeah, you mentioned sense. hybrid. I was, I was curious about that because as people come back to these environments, there's a good chance it's different. Uh, they, yeah. they, you know, on an office environment, they may no longer have an assigned desk, yep. or you know, there's yeah. different rules of how you move around the place and notifications and everything else. Did you guys get into that? Uh, a little bit. You know, we we've got a lot less assigned desk space. I'll add to that point, um, a lot more hoteling touchdown offices, and a lot of people have gone fully virtual from the support side of the house, um, especially with the staff. But in regards to faculty, we do really still need them on site teaching our, t our students in these small group learning environments. Traditional lectures is that one 
maybe specific area that we were able to try and keep virtual because you can kind of watch that as needed, right? Um, but outside of that, I would say um, most of the office space has kind of been left at who needs to be on campus and help with the support of our students in an in-person environment. Okay. Yeah, we had, we had a very similar experience. For us, uh, it came to the point where whomever was really needed to be in the office, like manufacturing, processing, stuff like that. Um, but if you were in sales or project management or, or, or departments like that where you didn't really need to be in the physical space, then you were allowed to work remote 100%. And that allowed um, to have more space for growth in areas that needed to be developed, such as yep. software development, mm -hmm. IT, and like people that needed to actually tinker with the simulators and, and the hardware in the office space. Mm -hmm. so. Jeff. Yeah, for us, um, when we started making the transition back to on-campus face-to-face instruction, well, we quickly learned that we would need to maintain the ability for um, uh, different modalities of teaching. Uh, and so our quick adaption of our physical classroom spaces to be able to accommodate kind of a hybrid instruction for both the in-classroom student as well as those participating remotely uh, was something I think that we did a really, really good job at. Um, it allowed faculty and students that maybe didn't feel comfortable coming back to campus for that face-to-face -face instruction, the option of actually taking their course virtually for a period of time. Uh, so we've actually included that uh, and standardized on that capability for uh, remote collaborative instruction from every one of our teaching and learning spaces on campus. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Uh, Projection is one of those things that has been around for a very long time. It's uh, changed dramatically with the advent of laser. Uh, you, you absolutely use projection in, in your b business. It's key. I'm curious when you're going to switch from projection to hitting golf balls against one of those things. Well, I mean, the moment we can get one of these to withstand the impact of a right. golf ball, <laughs> um, it'll probably be, it'll, it'll be, it'll it'd be, be lovely, but it. Uh, yeah. it would scare the hell out of people. <laughs> yeah, for sure. For, for us, projection is likely not going to go away. Yeah. Um, for us, uh, the advancement uh, that's uh, been made in, with the lasers, the changes in weight, um, the ability to increase brightness and making the units more compact. Um, has been very, very, very good for us. What, why does weight matter? Because our projectors are mounting on the ceiling, and you're going to need four guys to get one of okay, those 4K yeah. projectors that are weighing, you know, 200 pounds. Right. Whereas if now you have a 7,000, 8,000 lumen projector that only mm -hmm. weights 40, 50 pounds, you're mm -hmm. in good shape. Jeff, does your organization use projection? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think almost, I would say maybe 90% of all of our classroom spaces have uh, a projection of some form in them. Uh, the rest probably have flat panel displays uh, for smaller classroom spaces. Uh, we made a transition to laser a few years ago uh, and found, you know, for, for several reasons. One was because we were able to maintain that superior, you know, image and quality and detail that we really need uh, in instruction. Uh, and imagine an accounting class where we're showing, sh you know, spreadsheets and things that were very fine detail in a, in a, in a classroom of 400 students. That clarity and, and crispness of the image was always important. But something else that we found out that was, we knew this was going to be a factor. Uh, we knew that uh, cost was going to be one factor, but what we really were surprised at the reduction of problems in the classroom. So imagine how many times you have to dispatch a technician because of a lamp failure and, and lost class or interruption to lost class time. And those lamps were expensive. Yes, yeah. absolutely. So we only had, you know, we had the issue of lost class time. We had the issue of cost for maintaining a stock and you could only stock so much you know, keep them on the shelf. Uh, and uh, so there's a savings there. So if you put that all that together, maintaining the superior quality and image, it just keeps getting better and better, right? Um, but also the case cost savings of the elimination of the lamp cost. But then the time, the cost savings of time and the, the reduction of disruption to the instruction. Um, our trouble tickets regarding projection are almost non-existent now. Yeah, because we've agreed. made that transition. Yeah, which is is kind of a subtle cost center, but it's a yeah. it's a very sure. real one, right? It's a hidden cost, creeps up. Yeah, really fast now. Chris, same experience. 
Yeah, very similar. You're making it hard to follow, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, projection is our bread and butter. It always has been. Um, literally every learning space has some type of projection system in it. I would say the one exception to that are these small collaborative learning environments, which would then have your typical display and, and a pod that would seat about you know six to eight people. Mm -hmm. But uh, we've almost completed the transition from LAMP to laser, except in some of our um, auditorium type spaces, because I know that cost is still going to be fairly significant. Um, but yeah, we, we're pretty much laser all the way. And I would say the greatest impact outside of the image quality improvement is just not having to get up on like a 12 to 16 foot ladder and change those lamps. It was like, oh, this is way too tall. Maybe we should have our Sillies team be doing this work, you know? Yeah, right. <laughs> but um, they, that, that's nice not having to worry about the maintenance anymore. It's been a mm. huge, huge plus for us. There are vendors all through this, this trade hall and over in the other one as well who are, particularly this one, I guess, uh, marketing direct view LED as an alternative to LCD yep. tiled video walls, but also to projection with the idea that it's brighter, you can open the windows and everything else, or not open the windows, but yeah. right. open the blinds and like uh, <laughs> pull the curtains back and the whole bit. But uh, is it one of these cases where it's going to, it's not going to be a wholesale shift, it's like projection is going to work for certain things, but LED opens up opportunities in other ways? You know, I would say that there's only a couple of applications where direct view might benefit us. And to me, it would be in like your executive boardroom type of environment or maybe in an open lobby area, at least for my campus specific. I'm not saying that we can't expand upon that down the road, but in the classroom, I don't really know if it's necessary uh, in the learning environment really at all because the price point still really isn't there yet for us. Yeah. That's still a pretty, you know, significant cost jump. But in a space where... Um, I might have executive leadership meeting fairly frequently, and fun fact, in 2012, we installed, I think, was the largest plasma TV ever made at the time. It was like 106 inches. We're still running on this TV. It's probably the same amount as a video wall today, I and mean, it was like $50,000 purchase. It's funny how much things have changed in that time. It also weighed 50,000 oh, pounds. Oh my gosh, yeah. yes. Yeah, I don't know how they got it up to the fifth floor. Um, but the, I think having a direct view in that recessed space customized to fit right in the wall would look absolutely fantastic because believe it or not, that plasma still isn't big enough for the mm -hmm. farthest viewer. But at the time in 2012, I don't think they had another option. So I think that would be uh, an area that we could start adopting direct view. Mm -hmm. yeah. How about you? Um, for us, I think uh, projection, I think is in, in the classroom space is gonna be there for a while. Um, I do see some specialized applications uh, around uh, some of the sciences and research, uh, some of our, our virtual and uh, augmented reality labs, things like that. Um, I also see uh, uh, in higher ed, in, in some common area spaces, our university union, uh, student union, all those kinds of places, uh, where there's uh, some type of signage or display of information or promotion of things uh, I could see. Mm -hmm. For us, it's a lot more difficult because, you know, you can't really hit a ball, a golf ball to that, but um, it could be a value-added proposition in commercial spaces in which mm -hmm. you can add, share content, or if you have a league or a competition yeah. where you can share stats and, and do a little banter between, you know, golfers. Yeah. And, and it's probably more of a marketing play for your it'll company be, It'll be as more well. like a value-add more than anything right. else, yeah. One, one of the things that Full Swing Golf would do is a lot of data integration. Yeah. Uh, real-time data because you're doing the analytics of uh, somebody's swing and how bad it is like mine. Uh, is that kind of fundamental to how you work? And I'm curious what, what's happening in education and health environments as well as in terms of pulling together all these disparate systems and having the ability with sensors, with APIs, with uh, shared data sources and everything else to kind of really affect what's going on in an environment? Are, are, you, are you kind of moving to that or already there? We, we are there. Yeah. We are there for sure. Could and you describe what, what, what's the experience at Full Swing? Um, so what we do is we, with our technology, we actually track the golf ball. It's not just an algorithm that captures it from a video that captures your golf, your golf ball hitting the ball is we do have a camera, high-speed camera, that 
captures like your angle, your speed, and right. all that good stuff. Mm. But then our tracking technology will actually measure um, where your ball is going. Mm -hmm. So the importance of the projection is paramount because one of the things that we uh, we are very proud of is that we have zero latency. I was about to say, yeah, latency would be There's huge. no latency. Yeah. So as soon as the golf the golf ball hits the screen, you see it moving in the virtual world right away. Mm -hmm. And all your stats start moving around. Your right. carry, your spin rate, your distance, everything will start popping up. So the speed in which the projector can process the images and the, and the information mm -hmm. it receives is, is very key, as much as the brightness and the quality and crispness of the of the. Right. Of the now, project. you're on a university campus. Uh, there's a, uh, one hell of a lot of moving parts and things change hour by hour with different assignments for rooms and everything else. So are they using much in the way of like information and data systems to affect the digital signage? Um, not on a large scale, uh, maybe on a smaller scale, but we are definitely all about um, uh, student outcomes, right? The success of the students. So uh, we're very interested in technologies that uh, can be applied to the teaching and learning space that uh, would provide that student engagement and provide direct feedback to uh, to the instructor and be able to measure that interaction. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so I think everyone uh, knows about active learning spaces. Uh, we're looking to take that to the next level. So uh, how the student engages in their retention of what's being taught and mm -hmm. how we could potentially measure that uh, through uh, some of it is instructional design in the in the curriculum, but uh, also the use of the technology to uh, measure and, and engage the student in, in an active way, uh, ultimately to reach the desired outcomes we want. Mm -hmm. And Chris, in your environment? Yeah, I would say uh, active learning is probably our first and foremost, and it's something that we're trying to really revolutionize and create you know, a better learning outcome for all of our students. So. We don't just have an MD program, but we also work very closely with pharmacy and nursing, anything that's health sciences related. And so uh, these active learning rooms, they're in use day in, day out. And how that content is taught and received, it's, it's critical, right? Um, so we're trying to find ways to make sure that the retention, it's as good as it possibly can be, especially when they're still maybe not always in the room. Sometimes they might be in a, a virtual setting or they might break out into little small groups and then come back. We need to make sure that the retention and everything that they're learning is be, it's equitable across the entire class and in varying colleges on campus. So it's, it's a unique uh, job to be able to not just design a space for one program, but four or five. And then that can be quite a challenge. So we're, we're learning a lot along the way. And we still have a ways to go, but it's been quite the journey so far. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I was curious about the, the whole idea of uh, getting maximum mileage out of your investment and what, what you're starting to see in the collaboration space and video conferencing space is a lot of these guys are introducing quasi screensavers. Uh, so they're like, they're saying, when the screen's not being used, it could be digital signage, it could be messaging to students or to staff or whatever it may be. Uh, are, are you thinking about the same things in terms of how do I maximize the capital investment that I've made? That's a unique idea, one that I'm not very familiar with, to be honest with you. I'm not sure if there would be much of a benefit in active learning environment from that perspective and having it you know, be signage or some other, uh, you know, some other thing that's posted up for content. But I would say that we are, we're trying to maximize longevity. I think that's important to us too, mm -hmm. because when you're on a shared learning environment uh, with multiple colleges, getting funding to maintain those spaces is hard enough as it is. So when we need to try and refresh and, and keep to the, you know, I don't want to say bleeding edge, but we're, we're at the point where we know we're delivering an effective product for our students. Getting the funding is very challenging when you have to get it from not, like I said earlier, one college, but four or right. five. Yeah. And so that's probably an area that um, I spend a good significant amount of my time dealing with. Yeah. Anything else? No, not, okay. <laughs> uh, I'm curious Sorry. about what's really important when you're coming to a show like this and when you're sourcing technology. Uh, there are people who shop on price. 
There are people who shop on relationships. Uh, but I hear more and more that what's really, really important to them is uh, the relationship with the, the supplier, but also uh, things like security uh, and, and how locked down is the technology. Or do, what's important to you guys? All of the above is it's a relation with the supplier is important because you got to trust that the information mm -hmm. that you're sharing uh, is not going to be sold to a rival or a competitor. That's yeah. one. Um, you got to be able to, to trust that what they say they're going to deliver, they do, and not that somebody else offered you know a thousand dollars more per unit and they're going to go and sell it. Yeah. Sadly, that's something that's been happening a lot during COVID. And if there's anything, anybody in supply chain over here will probably attest to that. Uh, a lot, especially in commodities, components, that kind of stuff. If somebody offers them, you know, five dollars more a piece, then it's gone. And then you lose your stuff. So, relationship is important. Quality is paramount. Mm -hmm. uh, like we talked about the transition to the laser, right? Minimizing callbacks and issuing tickets for support. That's all critical. But um, pricing is important. But in the past two and a half years, um, it's been more about quality, relationship, and trust. Or, or just finding the stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Jeff? So <clears throat> in higher ed, uh, we've, we've started leveraging uh, the data network or IP network for uh, AV purposes. Uh, so transport of AV signaling across the data network is uh, in the security of that interconnectivity of devices living or existing on a shared network with our other university networking needs. Uh, is uh, the security of that is, is very much a concern of us. Uh, I'm very fortunate in that uh, one of my direct peers is the chief information security officer. So I work very closely with him. My team works with his team uh, to so it's ensure in your that, DNA we, now. Yeah, that we're mitigating as much as we can yeah. uh, and trying to identify that. And they do a fabulous job. But I think having that close relationship with uh, our security team is critical. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would say that relationships are probably my first and foremost uh, aspect I'm going to be looking at. So I, I tend to stick with the manufacturers that I have. I'm not sure that's a good or a bad thing, but I do have great relationships with certain companies, Sony being one of them. And I think they've always had a great product at a fairly reasonable price, uh, kind of leading into price. I feel like I'm getting exactly what I need, and it's delivering, and it delivers day in and day out. Um, security has recently, though, become very important to us. And it almost sounds like a bad thing. I mean, it was always important, but now it's starting to become something that we're spending a lot more time on. It used to just install, walk away. Now it's, no, we need to install, configure, work with uh, the information security team, our local teams, and the specific colleges to make mm -hmm. sure uh, that we're doing our due diligence and ensuring that security is being maintained. So segregating VLANs, right? Uh, making sure that the devices don't have Netflix on them, right? You know, if I get a certain TV, and sometimes I do have that, and I don't really think you need that in higher ed, you might prove me wrong on that, but uh, I, I try to, the minimal options as possible on certain yeah. devices, that being one of them. But what yes, the, what they call that bloatware? Been, uh, sorry? What do they call it? Bloatware, I think? Yeah, oh, yeah. Crap. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we, 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 gotta, we gotta really work on that here, but we're getting in a good spot. So. There's been talk for a number of years now how the AV world and the IT world are converging. Uh, the argument could be made that they're already converged, but I, I'm curious uh, from your perspective and, and what you see out there, what you're doing personally is, are, are these decisions around the technology to use and how to deploy and everything else, are they being driven still by the AV department if such a thing exists or IT or, or the, the same thing now? I would say they're, sorry, me? Yeah. <laughs> Whoever wants to jump in. We all look here. Yeah, yeah, we're over here. Uh, I would say that uh, it's still largely being driven by our AV group, but we are working more than ever with our IT team and our information security office than we ever were before. And so we're based in Phoenix, so I think there's a little bit of an added challenge there. I'm not at a main campus per se. Again, we're separately accredited, focused on medical, but our main campus happens to be two hours away right. in Tucson. And so we have to work 
uh, have really great, strong communication all the time, and work together with that main group to make sure that what we're bringing on uh, will end up meeting their policy and guidelines and ensure that we're delivering you know, the content that we need to be delivering. And I think one of the biggest learning experiences we had with that, bringing our AV onto the network, was with uh, NVX. So we're a big Crestron house, and getting uh, video over the network, that was quite the challenge. Uh, it took close to a year. Um, but we're at the point now where it's dialed in. So it, it's a good spot. Yeah, yeah for uh, me, um, I report to the CIO of our university, so we're within the division of IT. Um, when we made that transition, uh, when AV was outside of IT and we, we kind of did the conversion uh, and, and brought AV into that, uh, into that kind of hierarchy uh, within the university, um, there was a lot for us to learn about IT uh, and how ultimately we could, how IT is done and how we could leverage IT uh, for AV needs. Um, and we've had to kind of uh, lead the IT side of the house along with what AV needs are. So um, all of my team uh, on the AV side are very well versed in, in, in uh, network uh, you know, topology and everything you, know, you could think of uh, regarding the network. Um, our network folks are not so much, uh, you know, educated in in AV uh, in the needs of AV. So uh, I was gonna, we're I was educating gonna, yeah. them constantly, and we've had to kind of self-educate ourselves to learn both kind of industry or both sides of the house. Now that we've converged them into one. Yeah, I mean, you're 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 shifting to a world where people, uh, the way they think, they they'd be happy if the world was still on a command line interface and they don't, they yeah. don't care about pretty graphics or anything else. And as an AV person, you've got to say, guys, it's what's on this display, it's not how it works. Yeah, and uh, they're understanding that uh, data packets for video uh, need to be treated very differently than data regular data packets, you know, because of, of loss. And, and so that was a, an early battle of uh, the first time we turned multicast on the network, they were like, you want to do what? You want to put that on our network? It was like, yeah, and it needs to get there, you know, without any latency. Yeah. And they're, you're going to take our network down. I was like, well, <laughs> build a big, better network. So, <laughs> and they have. I'm guessing AV and IT are the same department with you, right? We, yeah, we don't have uh, an AV department per se. For us, it's mostly software development product group, and we develop specs, and then like, hey, we shop around. It's like, what? gives us the best customer experience overall, and then you see, is this good for residential and commercial, mm -hmm. or is it just for residential? And then you try to maximize it that way. But we do have um, folks in-house that are that have uh, certifications in multiple AV, mm -hmm. same as network, because we're a hybrid, right? We have right. computers that are networked and use technology, and then, of course, touch screens and displays and projectors and all that good stuff. You, you all would have, I suspect, a whole bunch of different software platforms all trying to coexist. And uh, you know, we live now in a world of APIs, so it's helped, but how important is the ability to integrate all these different disparate software things to, to kind of harmonize something? It's paramount. The, um, as we evolve, if there's a if, if there's an um, OS update that the software team has not vetted and a customer decided to just push it, it could crash the entire simulator. Mm -hmm. So there's always, you have always to fight, you know, build safeguards to mm -hmm. make sure that the end user can't just push the Windows, um, for example, Windows. When they were doing the Windows 11 push, we had customers that uh, we told them, do not update because we're still <laughs> certifying it. <laughs> and then you get all the text of, oh, I did the update, and, and now this and this don't work. And it's like, <laughs> but yeah, it's always paramount. So we're constantly testing releases and making sure that there's no crashes and no bugs. And mm -hmm. But you know, there's always one or two that escape, and there's always tech-savvy users that get ahead of the curve. and yeah. Push, push their own updates. Yeah, I love APIs. I love 
systems having those hooks there that you can uh, connect things together with. And, and I, something else I really love was when manufacturers partner with software developers to include and integrate that into their product mm -hmm. because that simplifies it for the end user. Let's say the designer, um, you know, designing a system or putting together something to meet a certain functionality or need. Uh, having that capability uh, or some of the capability already built in to a product and then having those hooks available through an API uh, or, or some other way of sharing data across systems is fabulous from a design perspective and ultimately the end user benefits and they may not even be realizing mm -hmm. they are, but uh, a lot of flexibility there. So. Chris? Yeah, I mean, it's extremely important, and I think um, two areas, and you might be able to relate to this too, Jeff, but it's uh, scheduling. I mean, curriculum scheduling and having it integrate with our native AV systems has been very important to us, and I think it's really taken a lot of the pressure off my group specifically, but it was quite the challenge just getting the scheduling display to sync and communicate with our scheduling system and be able to show. So how would that work? I mean, are you talking about uh, publicly accessible, visible displays that you would see on halls, always saying this, this is in the Tucson room or whatever at 10 o'clock? Right, right, and showing, you know, green if it's free, red if it's booked, right, but just a publicly visible display. Right. There, there's one at each space now on our Phoenix campus, which has been uh, a huge relief for our group because you never knew who had the room. And not everyone has access to the same scheduling system. And so when we brought those panels onto the campus and we bridged that API, it, it really changed everything, at least from that perspective. Now you know when you're in there, for how long, and who it's for. And so that API took quite some time. And we use, you know, it's a fairly popular system, Astra, but it's, Ad Astra is not the biggest in the education space. And so it took quite some time to develop and get that API to bridge that. Mm -hmm. I think. That was huge for us. And another area was lighting. Oh my gosh. I mean, we still have issues with lighting and at the touch panel trying to make that work in a specific space. And I think that's really important when you're trying to teach a specific class. Um, and so when you're trying to work with these legacy systems, there's not always going to be, and to my knowledge, we still don't have an API available to us unless we custom write, which is Buku money. And so now we have to change the lighting system. And so that's something that we're going to have to have a a little bit of a, a roadmap for it, but I think having that as an API would also be fantastic for our group. So yeah, the, the whole idea that you, know, you could have the sensors and, and systems all talking to each other, that, that experience just happens. Like if you walk into a, a meeting room, lights come on, they know who's there. Yep. Uh, they, they could give analytics to say that this many people actually showed up or the, nobody did. And you, know, you start to get the trending of Right. Bob books his room every Thursday and he never shows up. So sure, sure. somebody needs to have a chat with Bob or whatever. <laughs> yeah, and, and to add to that, we can't know that it's Bob, right? It can't be identifiable. At least that's been a huge focus for us. But knowing if it's actually booked and people are attending and using that space like they said they are, mm -hmm. that's very important. Especially when you're saying, oh, I need a room this size because my class is this big and it truly isn't, well that affects the other colleges that need to use that specific space type. I mean obviously space is at a premium here. We only have so many rooms that can perform a certain function. Yeah. So knowing that you're in the right space based on what you're teaching and your group size, absolutely, being able to have that data would be important. Now are we there yet? Not yet. We're getting a little closer. Do you guys consider where you're at with visual display and your different, very different environments uh, that you're, you're, you're kind of there, you're capped out, this, this, this is the solution set we need, we don't need to put any more screens in, or is it one of these things where this is going to evolve and there's just going to be more and more? So are you talking just the visual display, like the size of it in the room? Well, right or? now, in, in, let, let's say in your environment, you've got screens in conference rooms, maybe you've got some screens in hallways announcing sure. who's in the conference room and all that sort of stuff, but is that like step one of five uh, iterations of this, so will you see more and more, or is this kind of like where you, you're you at where you want to be? I think we're kind of at where we want to be, right? Um, I mean, everything is working where I really need it to be, but to be able to kind of, the people counting, that's an area that we could be improving upon, knowing that's really what I need to focus on. How many people are actually attending and are in that space, so I know that they're using the space properly. You know, I only have 
five classrooms in my campus. Yeah. So you can imagine trying to share those five rooms across all those different colleges. And our operating hours are from 7.30 in the morning to 10 at night because we do have programs that require the yeah. you know, people in a working career to come in after the fact and get their master's degree. So it, it's definitely a little bit of a unique challenge. Yeah, so if you have the analytics to say, I, I've got seating for eight in this room and on average three come in. Right that you can start to think about reconfiguring these rooms so you add a new, a, another one because you don't you need, you need seating for four, not eight. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and to add to that, I mean, that's another, uh, we're having a little bit of a pain point in our library of all places, study space. I mean, we always hear there's not enough study space and we only have a certain amount of rooms that can hold uh, five or six people. The rest of them only can hold two. Everyone wants the five or six seaters, but they want it for themselves. <laughs> they want a nice size, you know, a little conference room they can just study. And so I think we need to adapt to the people counting solution or some type of system that can track that, at least in our library, and that would help uh, utilize the space that we have better. Jeff, I, I'm curious, uh, for teaching, you know, we're, we're sitting in front of this big display, it's beautiful, it's, you know, it, it's, it, it pops and everything else. Do, do you see a time as costs come down and did these grow ubiquitous that these will be part of classrooms, big DVLED? I hope so, especially in larger, um, you know, lec lecture, lecture halls, four or 500 seat lecture halls. I could definitely see that happening. Um, we've done a fairly good job with multiple projection right now and being able to uh, show multiple images. And, uh, you know, it's, it's also part of it, I think, is, um, understanding what the, the need is. What is it that faculty need from the technology to, uh, to enhance their instruction, right? And if the technology that we're implying can do that, then we've met our, you know, our purpose and we've, we've been able to deliver on uh, what the need is. A lot of times we're the ones that are, I often refer to it as we're the tail wagging the dog. We have to lead, the technologists have to lead uh, the academic side of the university towards um, what is it that they need from the technology. Uh, I often say we can build you whatever you want to do whatever you need to do. We need to know what you want and what you need it to do. Uh, and understanding and, and if you have that, the money. <laughs> well, yeah, and then you have to have the money because uh, we can't put a price tag on it until we know what it is. Yeah. Um, so regarding uh, technology such as this one, I would love to have it in, in every teaching and learning space. Right now it's probably not practical, but I think that it's going to get there at, at some point. I, I have seen any number of stories about universities on the athletic side that are using a lot of wow factor, big video walls and all kinds of things as a recruitment tool for athletes to come out of high school and go play for the football team in Alabama or whatever it may be. D does that same sort of thing hold for how you, quote unquote, decorate uh, an educational environment or in your case, uh, uh, an entertainment environment where you, you have this kind of wow factor that makes people decide, okay, I want to come here, I want to learn here, I want to be a doctor here, whatever it may be. Definitely, you, you have to. The wow factor is how you bring people in. Yeah. Uh, if you want to, if you're opening a restaurant and you want to have people come and play around the golf or, you know, shoot some footballs or whatever, you want to make sure that the, that the product that you're using is inviting. Mm -hmm. it, it creates a great experience. So the wow factor is there. It has to be not only affordable, but the return on the investment has to be there. And it has to be sexy for people to come back and, right. and stay and spend some money and spend time with you. Definitely, it's important. Yeah, and Same thing I, in education? Yeah, in higher ed, um, I mentioned earlier student success. Um, that is our primary goal, right? Student success, if you think about the student of today is has grown up entirely in the digital age where everything is accessible from their handheld device practically, um, and they have very high expectations when they're picking a university. Um, so if they come to our university and walk in a classroom and all they're getting is a lecture over PowerPoint, we've, we're failing. Yeah. We're not, because we're not meeting that expectation. So if you talk about uh, from a university retention of the students that we have, but also trying to attract students to come to our university, if we don't meet that need, they're going to go to his university. Yeah. Because he's got the wow factor. He's got the latest thing. 
in the classroom space that's going to help the student engage and, and uh, have that digital experience. Digital experience is very important for the student of today. Does that extend to faculty as well? Well, for the faculty who want to come along with that, yes. There are still faculty who want to teach over PowerPoint and lecture. And that's I was going to say, there's do. probably tenured professors who <laughs> yeah. uh, we tried have to lead the drag of kicking and screaming. Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely, to add on to that. I mean, I think I'm a little fortunate in the fact that our campus really was designed about 10 years ago. So granted, a lot's changed in 10 years, but if you're talking about a campus, and I'm sure yours is much older, you have buildings that maybe are close to a century, if not more. 1801. Oh, wow. Yeah, so I'm not anything older than 2012. I've been very lucky. I haven't had to really deal with that. So I think when they started and designed that campus from day one, they had a very well master plan. You know, it was it was done right. And so we have a lot of great collaborative learning spaces. And I think technology was, it was huge. It was absolutely paramount when we first started this campus. I mean, we are a medical school, and so medical school is extremely competitive. And um, for most of you that aren't really in that world, you know, a student just doesn't apply at one school. They're usually applying at three, four, five schools, possibly across the country, hoping to get into one of those choices. And so I think having a campus that shows that teaching is absolutely critical and the technology delivering that content, it has to be there or we're not going to get the student. Mm -hmm. And we're already a, a very small cohort. Uh, we only have about 120 medical students per year. So being able to try and get the best talent to come through your campus um, and choosing your campus is one of their top choices. I think that's one of the absolute primary goals here. Okay, so when, when you come to Infocom, are, are, why are you here? Are, are, is it about meeting your existing vendors or are you, are you here to also see what's coming? And in, in the context of that, what are you kind of looking for? Is there something that I just wish somebody would come up with this thing or improve that thing? Uh, in my case, particular, I was I had one mission. It was with, with, to meet with a couple of people, and then maybe if there's extra time, just go look around. But my goal was to meet with specific folks for from yeah. the. Yeah, I mean it's a big networking show in yeah. a lot of ways. How about you, Jeff? Yeah. <clears throat> so p partly, uh, I did bring a team, a small team of uh, design team uh, here, mostly to look at what is the latest, greatest. Um, but mostly, probably more and even more important than that is we maintain our relationship with uh, the manufacturers we, we standardize on. Yeah. Um, and that's really important to us and it's really important to, uh, to the company that that relationship uh, uh, be maintained. So we're living right now in an age where uh, the supply chain is terrible. And, and so that relationship that you have with uh, the manufacturer or even the supplier and that transparency and the ability to be able to um, to talk directly and have that direct interaction and mm -hmm. transparency from the manufacturer um, is a big part of it. So I spend a lot of time doing that when I come here. I go meet with uh, all the different companies that we, we do a lot of business with, um, talk to them and, and, and just basically continue that relationship uh, and let them understand Mm -hmm. Here's what our expectations are. Here's what we need from your company. Here's the things that we're seeing in higher ed. Uh, we need we need these kinds of things developed or uh, continued development of these kinds of things because they're going to help us. Uh, so it's part of the relationship. It's part of seeing what's the latest, greatest, uh, where everybody is. Uh, and it's a good excuse to leave the office for a while. You know, got to just walk away from it all for a while. Yeah. Chris? Yeah, for me, it's uh, three separate areas. Relationships, absolutely. Uh, we got a few manufacturers that we make a point to visit and make sure that we're up to date with the technology they're putting out, Sony being one of them. Uh, Sony is a huge manufacturer for us at the Phoenix campus. Uh, but professional development as well and being able to network with other schools, other corporations, maybe people that are in the higher ed world or even outside of that, just to make sure that we're not missing anything and that we can learn from them as much as maybe they can learn from us. Uh, and then, of course, you know, training, you know, I think certification is really important. So mm -hmm. obtaining your CTS and uh, maybe some of the manufacturer trainings that would benefit our installs, I try to make sure that 
our group is really hitting those three key areas every time we come to Infocom, and it's right. great to be back. I mean, I haven't seen some of these individuals in, what, two or three years yeah. now, so I think that's huge to be able to, to meet face-to-face -face and be able to have a conversation, especially in with the supply chain. That's obviously hitting all of us, and trying to work around that has been difficult, and so those face-to-face -face conversations and meetings are really important. So. You go back uh, on Monday to your, your regular jobs and uh, you get asked by the CEO, the CIO, whoever it may be, what did you see? Uh, and if there's something that interests you, how are you making the end user argument about we should take a look at this? Is, it, is there a defined return on investment, on opportunity? Uh, does it have to address a defined problem uh, or, or you know w what's the business case that you make for you see something you saw something from Sony uh, you say I want a crystal LED wall and oh by the way I want to test it at home for a year first and yeah for us is um, if we find a way to enhance the the, comp the the end user experience where it's a residential or or a, or a commercial venue um, then you start evaluating costs and how does it work and mm -hmm. can we do we have enough space within the simulator area in order to install let's say one of these things or even a smaller one yeah um, and then if we do what kind of what kind of benefit is this to the customer yeah um, and then we start taking it from there um, for the most part what the purpose of, of my specific trip was you know what you guys said, improve the relationship, but it's also a couple of projects that we have for future developments right. that the face-to-face -face add something that a virtual call or a Zoom meeting mm -hmm. don't do. So for us, my conversation is going to be is, this is what we need to do in order to get this done going forward, and the output of that is going to be an improvement on X, Y, and Z. Right. Um, more than new products, more than new, because the projectors, yeah, the projectors are, are going to change a little bit. Maybe they add like AirPlay or Chromecast or whatever like that. For our use case, that doesn't necessarily add a lot. Yeah. Um, but when we talk about security, when you talk about size, when you talk about, you know, the, the, uh, the, L the LEDs and all those things, it's like, okay, how do we do a combination of those to make sure that the, the value proposition is there? So... If there's a casino in Las Vegas that want to buy 25 simulators that they actually get their money's worth, so then the next casino wants to buy another 50 so they can outdo them and yeah. then, something like that. So that's the kind of conversation that we'll be having. Okay. Jeff? Yeah, so we're all about trying to take things to the next level. So you think about it from uh, in teaching and learning from the, experience, or the perspective of uh, providing uh, not only the student an experience that they expect or that they benefit from, but also the faculty, uh, the application of te technology to uh, enhance the faculty's instruction. So we're always looking for what is the next best thing or to, how can we improve upon what we have today? Um, is there something that we're not meeting? Is there something we could do better? Uh, we talk a lot about standardization from classroom to classroom so that the faculty can maintain a, a consistent user experience that's intuitive so that when they go into a classroom space they've never taught in before, it's familiar to them, mm -hmm. the touch screen's the same, the technology. Unless it's a specialized room for a special need, then it may differ. So we're always looking for what are those things that we can apply to our teaching and learning spaces uh, that is going to uh, provide the faculty and the student the experience and the capabilities that they need. Uh, and it probably pretty, makes you pretty happy as well if uh, you know, like a company like Sony that has a pretty broad range of solutions and you know from conferencing to giant DV LED video walls, it, the, the fewer vendors you have and the harmony in between those different products I, I would just, I, I assume is important. Yeah, absolutely. Chris. I, I do agree with the less is You get more. the last word. We got one. Oh, do I really? One for right, you. I got to make it quick then. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> got 100 seconds. Go. 100 seconds. I'll go fast. Uh, yeah, less is more. I mean, and I really think that, to answer your question, if we're not improving the content delivery for the student, I don't think we're doing our job. So I really, it comes down to that for me. So 
for a value proposition and making sure that we're delivering to do what we need to do. I need to make sure that we're getting them the content as efficiently, as effectively as possible. And I think an area that I see at Infocom that we could probably adopt would be meeting equity, especially when you're in that hybrid type of learning, small group. Um, I really enjoy seeing when individuals are speaking in a room, you don't just got that one static shot from above the display. You know, it's actually going to be focusing on who's speaking. And that's something that we could really take advantage of, especially when you got virtual participants. Right. Because seeing that body language and those cues, I think that's very helpful. And that would help in our small group learning environments. Hmm. All right. Okay, well, thank you very much for spending time with me. This is super interesting, and hopefully uh, the folks here learned something. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you.